I think it's probably important that we do start thinking about some uh, worldviews uh, conceptually related to this. And I think, uh, you know, quite obviously, the first aspect is this idea of anthropocentrism. And that is, actually the word anthropocentrism is just the way I've written it, trust me. And uh, obviously human-centered thinking. And so you're familiar with that construct. You might also sort of be aware that there are certain aspects that there are strong versions of anthropocentrism and weak versions of anthropocentrism. And the strong version of anthropocentrism is probably related to that sort of dominion view uh, included in a lot of uh, fictional texts about how humans have the planet is theirs, it was made for them, everything on the planet's theirs. If there's an animal, eat it. If there's a tree, cut it. It's not a forest, it's lumber. It's ours. We're the rulers, we're on top, we're the best, we're the smartest. Uh, we deserve it, it's for us. Either some divine creator said it's all ours, go for it, or just we happen to be the smartest, so we deserve it. Then a weak version of that is maybe more like stewardship uh, where we understand that if we deteriorate the planet, it ends up impacting us. We're not so concerned about the species we call off for the species themselves, but we're worried that they might be tasty things we'd like to eat in the future, or they might cure some disease we get in the future. So we better save the planet because it's really just kind of like a big 7-Eleven for us, and we really don't, never know what we're going to need to pull off the shelf. But there's also, if I'm going to be critical of the Dominion, that some great creator made it for us so we get to do whatever we want with it. There's also a companion vision in some of those that the garden is something that we're supposed to tend. And that it is disrespectful uh, to a creator to just trash it. Uh, uh, and you can also think of the metaphors that this is wilderness which needs to be conquered and again, quite literally, the metaphor of a garden, which is something you tend and keep and that sort of thing. Uh, and it is quite likely in terms of debate that while you will be accused of being this in many cases, you certainly have to defend this version of it if you're going to be accused of that. And this happened in, around I was watching right, uh, Northern Kendra, you're your partner. Uh, was it? Maybe. No, 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 I'm sorry. It was the other Northern Arizona team. Uh, and what they were saying is uh, it was the fishes topic or the water streams and, and things topic. And so they were going, you know, we kind of need to do this thing. And it's not super deep ecological, but it's a step in the right direction, you know, that sort of thing, the sort of. Uh, you know, incremental environmental solution. And I said to my friends, like, look, if you're going to be a policymaker, you're not going to be able to be deep eco. What you can say is, we personally are deep ecological, but we understand in a policymaking framework the best we can get is weak anthropocentrism. And we're just using the arguments available to us as advocates that we would use in a public forum because we can't talk about intrinsic value to the American public. We can't talk about biodiversity being a value that's in and of itself something that's important. We have to talk about things that relates back to human impacts. And so we're just modeling the type of behavior that policymakers would have to do if they're going to try and save the environment. And so while your K is like, oh, we're the devil, your fucking K ain't going to fix shit. <laughs> and in a pragmatic view, which is not necessarily a four-letter word, literally or figuratively, uh, we have to do things as policymakers that embrace weak anthropocentrism. Because it at least acknowledges there's a relationship between humans and the planet, rather than of, of at least equity of some sort and care, rather than one of domination. And so I think that's a, a pretty crucial thing. But again, the other aspect then is biocentrism, which is nature-centered thinking. But before you get your, you know, green on and go, yeah, deep ecology, tear down the dam, spike the trees, uh, biocentrism didn't exist out in nature. Humans made that shit up too. 
Biocentrism is a human construct. And any trying to utilize biocentrism will always be done through human measures. There is no natural formula for existence that we just have to discover carved into a rock somewhere, right? Everything is subject to human interpretation. And so even biocentrism is a human construct. And it's going to be based on human biases and perceptions and those types of things. So uh, it's kind of a, a, an issue that, you know, when people get all deep ecological, cool, it is an interesting thought experiment. It is probably even a useful way to think about how we should implement public policy. It is probably a much better version of weak anthropocentrism than just acknowledging that humans have to come first. That maybe in some cases other non-human values are maybe more important than human values. But it's still a human construct. It's still implemented by humans and it's still filtered through our perception and reality. I think uh, other things that you might want to be familiar with is this issue of mechanism. That we often break down the world into its component clock pieces. It's that idea that allows you to say, oh, well, if there's some wetlands where you want to build your Walmart, just put some new wetlands in over here. Like they're just pieces you can move around without understanding that those wetlands developed over hundreds of thousands, maybe not millions of years. And that there's a reason they're there and that they're interconnected to biosystems and biomes. They're probably important to migration patterns and shit. And that if you just move the wetlands and all of a sudden all the geese that come down and go, hey, we're in a fucking Walmart parking lot. Where's our wetland and shit? And shit. And uh, so this is the aspect, but, but think about how many things that are tech solutions that sort of just break it down into mechanism. Oh, well, we'll just use tech for that. Because it's, it's just a bunch of pieces, and if we just manipulate the pieces, we can get different outcomes. And this, you know, obviously is against the construct of holism and the interconnection of things. And so those are aspects. Oftentimes, you might be able to find elements of mechanism in a plan text or a solvency explanation that get you links to say, here's the difference between whether you're this, this, or this. So those things. Uh, Gaia. Earth is uh, organism constructs. And there's, you know, several versions of Gaia. There's the crystal wearing herb munchers that are just trying to replace Jesus with Earth. Whatever. If you just want to believe the Earth is a living being so you can have some new form of faith, cool. But it's not really going to save the planet. But if you're trying to understand it as it's a living organism in the sense of holism and that everything's interconnected, I think that sort of scientific knowledge about it is uh, one way to think of it. And so you have to be aware that there are various strains between the woo-woo environmentalists and the more sort of biologically oriented environmentalists. But let's not completely dismiss the woo-woo environmentalists. Uh, because in some ways, what they're talking about is a connection in what is generally considered an important aspect of seeing yourself in relationship to the planet. And again, I'm going to look at Northern Arizona, but you weren't in this round, <laughs> but your other team was. And so they were running these status quo, sort of pragmatic, we'll take care of rivers and streams in a very governmental sort of way. And the other team was running their deep eco critique. And the guys were saying, we have to see yourself in relationship to things and the way the earth goes, blah, blah, blah. And so the question was, can you explain that without using the word relationship so much? And I kind of laughed inside because, no, he probably couldn't because relationship is the core construct that many people that are trying to have environmental awareness are trying to emphasize is that we are in relationship to the planet and that that understanding helps us see if we're harming it but also seeing the benefit it gives back to us in sort of unique ways. And I think it was really explained pretty well 
Uh, in terms of even ecofeminism, which there are as many versions of, of anything out there, uh, you know, any ism is not one singular he hegemonic thing. But, you know, uh, some people are like, well, I'm me, and the planet's the planet, and we can't really interact because I'm human and it's a non-living entity. Okay, well, that's a non-relationship status. But then you have the people go, oh, I am the planet, the planet's me. Uh, and it's like, well, that's not very healthy, right? If you've ever been in a relationship with somebody who thinks they're you, it's time to get a restraining order. <laughs> because it's not healthy. Because then they start to think that if I act with what I want, that's what the planet wants. Or, you know, I was just trying to do what you want because that's what I want. So I brought you chicken soup when you were sick and they, like, overtake care of you. It's like, give me some effing room. <laughs> right? You know? Uh, but if you see yourself in a relationship with somebody, you're both separate entities, but you're interconnected. The actions of one impact the other, even if you're not of the same thing. And I think that's a pretty important aspect to realize. And in some ways, again, that explanation of relationship makes sense even in weak anthropocentrism without having to go all the way to biocentrism. All right. I think that's a cool. Uh, I mentioned ecofeminism. Uh, here's a deal, though, is hierarchy, and if you know anything about Kenneth Burke in your communication, he says we are a animal that's goaded by hierarchy. <laughs> we just love it. Why, do we, why, would, why is there a top 40 in music? It seems like music would be something that you wouldn't rate against each other, that if you like it, you like it. It doesn't matter whether it's number one or number 30. Why are we so worried about the box office of movies? Why when we meet people so, hi, I'm Steve. How's it going? What do you do? Nothing. See? But that's a hierarchical question, right? I want to know where in the hierarchy I stand next to that person. You never thought of how do you, what do you do as a question of hierarchy? But it is, isn't it? You're trying to figure out, am I above you or below you when you ask that? It's not a polite question. It's a power question. Because we're goaded by hierarchy. Now, is the hierarchy problem race over race? Well, if we could just get rid of people thinking they're racially superior, we'd solve hierarchy. Is it man over woman? It's that damn patriarchy. If we just solve the patriarchy, everything would be unlocked. Or is it man over nature? Well, if we just got rid of our, right? And so some people just say, F those. Those are just specific examples. The problem is hierarchy. And you have to reject it in all its forms. There's no one magical hierarchy that if you unlock, all of a sudden all other hierarchies disappear. And so, kind of a, a construct to think about, because ecofems might talk about that, and uh, those types of things, and if you get a big patriarchy critique, then you could say, well, you might be able to deal with this issue, but how are you going to fix this issue? Just because you fix this issue doesn't mean we have the same cognitive tools or rationale to fix this issue. What you really have to fix is our belief in hierarchy is normal and natural and acceptable, not that any one hierarchy itself unlocks all others. And so that sort of is this idea of uh, social ecology, which is uh, Bookchin. Yeah. Who's dead now? He used to hang out in Burlington, Vermont, but he's dead now. <laughs> so, who knows where he may be hanging out now? Uh, he, he is, he is the Earth. Yeah. Unless they <laughs> shot him into space. Uh, there's a, a former debater who, have you heard of this company that will shoot your remains into space? Yeah. Yes. He's maybe, a former debater. A satellite. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Charlie Chafer. So, yeah. Mm. All right. All right, so these general constructs, general environment stuff, cool. So, some of those philosophical issues. There's also, uh, you know, like bioregionalism and those types of things, which make an incredible amount of sense that we shouldn't have artificial political boundaries, that we should 
uh, organize our societies along the lines of environmental awareness. So, uh, and here I am just doing the wrong thing by putting a political map up here, but right, but that kind of makes sense. These lines don't really make sense if you take a look at the earth because there's all this other stuff up here. And so really what we probably should do is say, well, let's get rid of these. And here's the Mississippi River. And it runs, you know, all over. It goes, it, the headwaters of the Mississippi start in Montana, which is kind of cool. Well, I guess the headwaters of the Missouri start in Montana, but it connects to the Mississippi and St. Louis. Uh, but if you look at the watershed of uh, the Mississippi, it's huge. Now you know why you don't drink the water in Louisiana. It's like the bunghole of America's industrial and agricultural waste processes. Think about all the factories that are in here. Think about all the agricultural runoff in here. Think about all the highways where tire particles and oil distillates and things run off the road and get in the water stream. And then you have a nice glass of ice water down here in New Orleans. Is it ice water or ice water? I've heard both. <laughs> I've heard it both ways. And the, the, I've knew people from New Orleans, and they go, the tourists always ask for bottled water, and then they say, can I have some ice for this? And it's like, dude, the ice is coming out of the municipal system, you dickheads. Oh, well. I'm a little cursy this morning, sorry. Um, but let's forget this industrial waste mess of nonsense. There's this beautifully wonderful thing called the Columbia River, which would be a fine way that everything that's part of the Columbia River watershed should probably be a political unit. Because their interests all are far more interconnected than the way the lines on the map are drawn. But how the Columbia River goes impacts the economy, the well-being and health of all the people who live in that watershed in more dramatic ways than if we start putting some freaky lines on here and there's like even two nations and like now try and coordinate those sorts of things. And so that's what bioregionalism is all about is like, let's figure out the relationships that we have to the planet and use those for organizing social systems rather than the arbitrary lines we put on stuff. All right. I think there are other big issues, uh, not necessarily so ideological but more practical, but the problems of science and public have huge impacts on the way you debate things. Because every time you see climate, it's really, it's stories in the news, it's really that revelation of how difficult it is for science to be understood by the public. It's also a revelation of how difficult it is for scientists to communicate with the public. It's also a really good demonstration of how people who try and interpret science in public who aren't scientists make such a huge mess of it. Uh, and so the public is scientifically illiterate, and the scientific community is illiterate in how to communicate with the public. And in fact, many scientists are sanctioned for trying to be public scholars. Uh, I don't know if any of you watched The Big Bang Theory, but if you remember, there's that time where Sheldon goes to the book reading by one of the scientists, and he like asks this question, which is just scathing, and then he goes, oh, just kidding, because the, the and is he's trying to sanction this guy for writing science books for the public. That's a thing in science. Because uh, when you get your PhD in the academic community, what it really is is initiating you into a philosophical construct that the brethren accept you into, rather than proving you have any knowledge. Inside the brotherhood, it's all good, but they don't really care if it makes any sense outside the brotherhood. If you think back to thinking about PhDs, when you've been at graduation ceremonies and stuff, when the faculty are all in those weird robes and shit, it's a cult. <laughs> and so most PhDs are more interested in replicating knowledge and protecting the discipline's boundaries than they are about really doing good for people outside of the discipline in very serious ways. And so. When scientists try and talk in public, they're often chastised. Or if they don't do science in public, but just try and be scientists in public, think about the way that scientists talk. 
Well, we think there is a significant relationship between these variables, or there is a positive connection between these two interactions. Well, when the public hears positive, they always think, oh, well, that's good. But they might be talking about that positive connection meaning a negative impact. And also, scientists won't say this is 100% true, because they don't think anything's 100% true, because the next person that comes and does their experiment might prove them wrong. And so for them, they might say, well, we have a high degree of certainty that this effect is likely. <laughs> That's about a 100% statement from a scientist, but it sounds incredibly conditionalized to the general public. And so they make powerful statements understood in the scientific community as, wow, they're really out on a limb, that the public hears it's like, why are they pussyfoot? Why are they so you know, conditionalizing their arguments on that? So not only is the public stupid, uh, they also don't understand that when scientists are saying, saying things are effed up, how effed up it is because it doesn't sound effed up in common language. What they need is the scientists come out and say, we're effed up. And we're 100% certain we're effed up. Yeah, that kind of language doesn't work in relationships, too. Like, I have a high probability yeah. that I'm going to mow the lawn this weekend. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. But you probably will. But I, I leave a small percentage that I might not. Yeah, 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 right. And I don't want to be a liar later. Right. But it's more than likely you will. Yeah, yeah, true. All right. So science and public problem. If you remember that whole climate gate thing, not climate gate, climate gate, uh, where they got the emails from East Anglican University in the UK, uh, which is one of the lead universities on climate science, part of the IPCC structure, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and there's a couple of emails, and it says, one was, we'll use that trick uh, uh, to show our, our calculations here, and uh, we'll stop that guy from publishing. Okay, so they, they leaked these emails. This shows they agree, they even understand that they're just tricking us and that that science is bad. And look, they're trying to stop people from producing views. That proves it. Global warming's a fraud. And here's the problem is they were being human. Uh, because what do you call the K? Cheat. The cheat. We're going to be cheating this round. Well, what if somebody outside the debate heard you say that? Those debaters are going to cheat. Those aren't the bastards. This whole activity's bankrupt. I can't believe we're training people to cheat. But is the K really cheating? No. But you can imagine then that someone who's come up with a formula or a way to chart or diagram something and science might say, we'll just use that trick because it's a shortcut or something that's not really a trick, but they call it a trick because just metaphorically in everyday conversation, like we said, the K is not really the cheat but we call it the cheat because it just saves so much time and avoids that whole explanation of fiat, non-fiat, and what straight up is versus not straight up, and how some people feel about it and whatever. And so that's the way trick was used in that. It could be proven by math and calculations and et cetera, but it was just a shortcut in this email to call it the trick because that meant everybody in the email chain instantly knew what formula they were referring to. And we're going to stop that guy from publishing it's because that dude was a dick. It wasn't because he had different data. It's because they just didn't like him. Right? You've all left somebody at the hotel when you go out to eat. Hey, did somebody get so-and-so? No. Did you get so-and-so? No. Did you get so-and-so? No. Good, let's go. <laughs> right? It's not like that guy's not trying to win debate rounds for your school. He's just a dick. And so they caught scientists being human, and they held it against them. And they, the fact that scientists were human was supposed to prove that global warming was a hoax. And so they went through and they reviewed all this stuff, and they came to these conclusions. But right, what do you remember about climate gate? That scientists lie, and they're trying to suppress data. And in fact, it was scientists use metaphors to refer to techniques, and they're human. That's all climate gate really proved. But what's the public going to think about climate gate now? They don't remember, they didn't listen to the panel that reviewed all these things. They just listened to the Fox News stories. Uh, all right. 
Also, human time versus geologic time really complicates the issue because I get to this. Here's Earth and. At one point, this was the frickin' Earth, right? I debate for Pangea State. I've been around a while. Right? Well, what do we do? We wait a few billion years, and we get what we have now. And it's true. Species adapt. Species change. Uh, Let's say this is a scale of 1,000 miles. Well, I'm a tree. Do, 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 do. I'm a tree, hanging out. Blah, blah, blah. And I drop some seeds. So a tree grows next to me. Da, da, da. I drop some seeds. It grows next to me. Da, 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 da. I drop some seeds. It grows next to me. Da, da, da. So over, say, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 years, a population of trees could literally move, right? And over that time, let's say climate changes naturally and wipes out this part of it, well, it's going to survive because given a few hundred thousand years, it has time to move. But these trees start dying off because it's too hot or too cold for them. But these trees that are a few feet next to them manage to survive. So you can imagine how pissed off I get when people say, oh, global warming's no big deal. The planet will just die. Not in 50 freaking years. In 50 freaking years, everything dies. It doesn't leave seeds. It doesn't move the 1,000 miles. We're hosed. But humans don't get geologic time frame. They don't understand. I mean, I'm 50 now. I've lived twice as long as you people. It doesn't make me smarter, but it certainly makes me view things differently. But even I don't get people who are 70 and 80, right? You don't get 100 years. Uh, let's say there's somebody today that's uh, 40, and they had a parent that's maybe 40, so what's that make that? Uh, 1973. And they have a parent that was 40 when they were born. What's that make that? 1933. That's not a strong super mine. Uh, 1993. All right, cool. Should be a seven, okay. All right. All right. So you, parent, grandparent, uh, great-grandparent. So there are people alive today whose great-grandparents were owned. So why is race not fixed in this freaking country? Because it's not that many generations away from we owned freaking people. People have family stories from great-grandparents that were told firsthand to their grandparents about being fucking owned. Now, on the other hand, you could say we've rapidly changed. <laughs> right? Given the scale of human existence and recorded history, that kind of changes pretty fast. But it's not that fast in, you know, right? I mean, so geologic time is just something we don't get. Uh, what's the thing if uh, the Earth was a 24 hour clock? Humans wouldn't show up till the last second of the last hour. We would show up at 11.59.59. The Earth's been here hanging out. Do, 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 do. We're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. Last second, boom, here's Earth, humans, and it's like, oh shit. We waited all the time for this. This is what we get. Also, there's you know some dispute of I'm willing to believe that humans have maybe been around a million years. I don't know. It's tough to say. Who knows exactly? And then they say there might be uh, a couple of versions of humans out there. And Neanderthals and humans might have existed at the same time. Neanderthals didn't become humans. The sapiens just wiped out the Neanderthals. And who knows? But you have to remember that you are sitting here in this room the product of a million years of evolution more than you are a product of 5,000 years of human history. I could bring in a bee or a spider in here, and some of you are going to have a panic attack. 
You don't know why. I can tell you why. It's because over millions of years, your species has learned that something might kill your ass and to avoid it. I could have a handgun on my hip, though, and not many of you would freak out as much, and which is actually more deadly to you. We haven't evolved evolutionary the understanding that something that can really kill us, and yet that little bug or spider freaks us out. Because we've had a million years to react to bugs and spiders. We've had maybe a couple hundred years to react to guns. It's probably why we're so stupid about them. We haven't evolved evolutionary to understand danger. Don't have those around. So, uh, you have a question about yeah. geologic time. <clears throat> so, it, it, you know, I mean, if we look at it as a whole, where, you know, before any of the biodiversity that we have now, the moon and the Earth collided, and yeah. you know, like it's it's gone through rap, you know, like massive changes over, you know, so much time, and we are just the last second of the last hour, then the stewardship of of humanity trying to preserve what we view as how the Earth's ecology should be for our own for our own purposes of surviving on the planet simply prolongs the next stage in the Earth's evolutionary cycle? Um, that's the thing is, is the world looks static, but it's dynamic in larger scale. In human scales, the Earth is static. Except like you're seeing glaciers melt and things like that. You are seeing some dramatic changes in your lifetime. But uh, really, uh, in any human's life, things look very static. Uh, but the thing is, is that what you're probably trying to do is lessen your impact of anthropogenic causes of damage. You can live with the world changing, but you just don't want to be the cause of that world changing. And that's the, sort of kind of the crux of climate. You don't want to contribute to changes, even though you can live with natural changes. But you don't want to be the cause of changes that are unnatural. Right? Like pumping more CO2 than has ever been in the atmosphere is probably something you'd want to avoid because it will change things beyond what is a natural scale. Uh, Bill McKibben has written a book called The End of Nature, and he says that if nature is the absence of human presence, then nature is dead, because not only can you go places where humans haven't been and find petroleum, uh, evidence of burning petroleum through aerosols that are fallen and stuff and, and pollution and things, so even places humans haven't been, there's evidence of human existence. But even to the extent we've changed the weather, that we will never have another natural summer. The, the weather we now have is human produced. So we have killed nature, which is kind of depressing. And probably we should try and avoid that. And so we have to look at our actions in a way, it really is that sustainability model of, uh, let's not try and do anything that impacts the planet that becomes permanent impact on it. And it's okay to be anthropocentric too, right? We don't complain when cats are feline centric. Like, I think it's kind of cute. Oh, that cat wants what, wants what it wants. It's not neat. It's bumping up. Hey, give me some attention. When really just saying, where's the food? But we mistake it for love, but that's okay. Um, and so uh, we don't care when other things are kind of centric, but it's really just sort of managing our own centrism. Cats aren't creating global warming. Right? And so we can live fulfilling our needs without impacting the system around us. And that's the thing that should probably just happen. All right. All right. Uh, all right, so I think you get there's controversy. I think you get there's stuff. Uh, let's take a look at the, the assorted scenarios you might talk about. Uh, there are agricultural impacts related to global warming, right? If uh, here's our happy planet, and I'm going to be North American, South American centric because they're somewhat easier to draw. Um, all right. Well, stuff that grows in this band of latitude won't grow there anymore, right? Also, stuff's going to get hotter, stuff's going to get colder, stuff's going to get wetter, stuff's going to get drier. And that's an interesting thing, too, is do we call it global warming or global climate change? Technically, it's more appropriate to call it global climate change. What did the Republican advisor once tell people to call it? Global climate change, because it's less scary than global warming. And there's one aspect where he actually told them to call it the scientifically accurate thing. I don't think he knew he was being accurate, but he's just saying people respond better to global climate change than global warming. It's not as scary. But scientists will call it global climate change because that's what's going to happen, because uh, 
oh, let's go ahead and include those British monkey spanks over here and their European neighbors. Uh, so there's ocean cycles, right? Right, that's how Europeans got over here to exploit the new world. Well, there's a cycle. Well, as stuff melts, what's melting? It's fresh water. Fresh water and salt water have different densities. When there is more uh, fresh water released, this ocean cycle might not go the same way because ocean densities are different. Well, Paris and Vancouver are the same latitude. If you drive up to Vancouver, you'd be at the same latitude as Paris in Europe. That's how far north Europe is. Okay? So how does it stay survivable? Because of this ocean current that brings warm Caribbean air. Yaman, bringing the warm breezes up to Europe. Well, if the density of the ocean changes and those currents change, this just becomes a frozen wasteland. And so Europe could get colder as the ice caps melt. And so global climate change is really accurate. It still is catastrophic. All right, so agricultural impacts, biodiversity impacts. We already showed that stuff won't be able to move. We might be able to plant crops in different places, but native species won't be able to move. So biodiversity impacts, the European Ice Age, sea level rise, uh, the new National Geographic, I just got, uh, oops. is your homeland under warming. Miami? Bye-bye. Florida's really flat, by the way. So that's why it just disappears. Uh, Tallahassee? Who is Pine Bluff, Arkansas? It's now oceanfront property. Uh, fuck New Orleans. <laughs> fuck wow. Houston. San Diego remarkably hangs on. Uh, but, uh, look, Yellow Seattle screwed. and Vancouver kind of change. Uh, Boston, New York, Philly. DC will have levees. Yeah. There'll be the Venice, the New World. Yeah. All right. Uh, we got to let's take a look at Europa. London is now oceanfront property. Yeah. Well, they already know that. Yeah. They know they're low. St. Petersburg, look at that. This requires it to melt all the ice. Look at the uh, uh, Middle East. And they talk about that too. Yeah, yeah, the tropics, the ocean level goes up more because it's warmer water. And right now, the ice masses actually pull water towards it yeah. through gravity. And that is, it melts, and there's less gravity in the ice packs than the water surges back outwards. Uh, but Asia, and remember that aspect that if you drew a circle around this, more people live in this circle than the rest of the planet. They better learn to swim. Better learn to swim. Look, even Beijing is underwater. Is there a time frame for that? Or something? That's all the ice. And it would say, uh, unchecked warming melts all the ice. Oh. Not to say we're cool or anything. Yeah, not to say that any other scenarios. Uh, but this is uh, the extreme hypothetical that's supposed to be a preemptive warning. Yeah. So and uh, but true. think about it too is uh. Even if not all the ice melts, the national security implications of actually having a Northwest Passage, we now have to defend the Northern Sea that we've never had to defend before. And Russia's already starting to make some claims on that shit. 
And so it even impacts our national security calculations. Because our big safety net is, let's get some nuclear submarines with uh, multiply independent targeted warheads and park them under the ice cap. No one can touch them. Well, if there's no ice caps, those submarines become vulnerable in ways that uniquely we haven't prepared for. And also, all of that area becomes disputed territory in terms of who controls it. And now then think about the access we have. For shipping, great, there's a shortcut to Asia from Europe. But think about the national security implications of having new shipping routes that have to be protected and or secured and or people claiming. And so there's a lot of national security implications beyond just environmental hazards to consider. Uh, if that happens, we're not just going to let those people drown. Well, yeah, we will. But other people will be concerned about them. But think about the immigration problems that exist. And think about how most conflicts you debate about now are issues of one people not wanting another people living next to them. It explains Sudan and Darfur. It explains South Sudan. It explains Ethiopia. It explains almost every conflict. It's people who don't want people living next to them or don't think they should be near them. Now what happens when the oceans go up and those people have to go somewhere? So just think about the political conflict and military conflict that happens with immigration. It's not just the people in Miami have to move. They now might have to move to a northern state. Uh, economic shifts. Look at the winners and losers here. Think, uh, I think they're you know, saying that Miami faces $3 trillion worth of economic impact. And that's just Miami. Water wars. Diseases, disease vectors. Remember when we started hearing about Ebola? Well, that's because humans started pushing further and further in, but also Ebola could survive more and more out. That virus was able to have tropical wet conditions that it could expand its range, even as humans were expanding into its range. So you can imagine the bacterial toxic soup of germs that will be spread everywhere now and more easily. Superstorms. Sandy, <coughs> already happening. Heat death, we hear all the time when there's a heat wave in major cities about people just kicking off. Uh, you know, so just direct impacts and then the emergency threats. Now, so you probably are reasonably aware of the impacts. Here's the stuff I don't want to tell you because it's wrong, but it's out there. But Okay, so here's our happy planet. Here's that sort of layer of the atmosphere where the sun's rays are getting trapped, right? The whole greenhouse effect thing. But when you drive your car, stuff comes out. And you don't see a lot of the stuff, right? But if you've ever been behind a truck and you see that big billowing thing, that's not gas, right? Those are aerosols. <coughs> and what that means is they are solids able to be supported in the air. So if you had that truck in an enclosed space and saw that big black smoke milling out, it wouldn't just dissipate. Eventually it does just fall down to the earth, right? It's a solid. But it stays suspended in air. It's so light for a long time. Well, think about all the fucking carbon we burn and all the aerosols that are out there. But being a solid, think about the properties of a solid. When light rays hit that solid, they reflect back. So the Earth is actually artificially cooled by aerosols from carbon burning because it refracts some of the light back out. So not all the light is absorbed into the system. Some of it gets pushed back out. Now then, if your plan is we'll stop burning coal, think about how many less aerosols will go into the air and how much warming will increase even though you're putting less CO2 out. So we got that going for us. Yeah. Now, obviously, we should stop burning carbon because it's going to warm no matter what. It just will increase the rate of warming slightly when we take aerosols out of the air. Um, I think another really interesting way to bring that argument, um, like another step to that, is the grasshopper effect, in that when you have these particles that they evaporate and go up into the, into the sky in the hot air, and then they move around in our like um, wind patterns, and they settle in places like the Arctic. Yeah. And so that's why like indigenous, like indigenous people in northern Alaska have been doing the same thing for since time immemorial, um, have nine times the amount of pollutants in their bodies than someone in the lower 48 states. Yep. Because our pollution 
it goes up in the air over us and it settles down on them. So. Yes. Uh, some people say, hey, let's go seed the ocean with iron, and it'll help the phytoplankton, and the phytoplankton will help absorb some of the CO2. So some people will say, we can just solve warming by ocean seeding. Uh, some people will say, night warming's awesome. CO2 doesn't really increase daytime temperatures, it just keeps things warmer at night, and plants like that. Um, it prevents the upcoming ice age. But here's the thing, too, is that uh, what color is ice if it's not covered by coal dust? Yeah. White and shiny. Reflecty. What happens is you have less ice? Absorby. We're losing permafrost in Alaska because more and more soil is getting exposed and it heats up more than ice does. And so it actually now then if the earth is holding more heat, Warming increases. So as the ice caps, yeah, just saying, like, with, with the ice caps, um, there are giant pockets of methane, called methane clathrates, underneath the ice in the Arctic. And yeah, they're under so much pressure. I think it's like, um, I think this, the methane in there is compressed like 32 times greater than normal methane. Um, and so the thing with the melting ice is that even if it, even if that does assume that all the ice is melted, the more ice melts, the faster it melts because it releases the giant pockets. Of and methane's a, a warming gas. Yeah, more so than CO2. Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing is when the permafrost disappears, the methane that's trapped under the permafrost escapes and warming increases. So, uh, yeah. So, I think these are all terrible negative arguments, though. But you will hear them. And so I guess I'm maybe warning you more than I'm saying encouraging you to run them. Uh, another one that negative, that negative slides encounter, and it's saying that like, oh, longer growing seasons is better for agriculture. But like what you said earlier, like those agricultural belts can't shift because when it moves up, it's moving into areas that has doesn't have like soil that's been developing for thousands of years, and so. And longer growing seasons probably mean more chemicals. Yeah. Because we will run through growing seasons and deplete the soil. And when you deplete the soil, you get erosion and, it, you know, right? So all these things that can be positive. Now, uh, a list of possible responses. Remember the market solutions, tradable permits, carbon taxes. Also, full social cost pricing is something to consider. That we, there shouldn't just be a tax that goes to the state, but there should be a tax because you're putting externalities out to the environment on fossil fuels. So true cost pricing, command and control regulation, alternatives to fossil fuels. But I'm always shocked when people think that carbon-based alternatives will solve global warming. So we'll just burn another form of carbon called gasohol. It's still fucking carbon. Um, Conservation, no one ever thinks of that because we're in a growth economy. Uh, decreased consumption, no one thinks of that because we're in a growth economy. Uh, create carbon sinks. UW was talking about at one point creating some caves with chalk or something in them. But this is that techno solution mindset that the earth is just a big machine and we just need to manipulate the parts of the machine. Uh, reforestation, ocean iron seeding. Population growth of human control. Now that's a great answer, but how do you do that unfairly? I mean, how do you do it fairly? Yeah. Because you know if we have draconian population control, we're only going to control brown people. But it's uh, it, it cuts against the poor uniquely because rich people can have kids. And it cuts against the religious too. Well, F them. <laughs> it's not like they're a protected class. I mean, it's not an immutable characteristic. I guess Jewish they would people be, might say But they would be in that scenario. Yeah. yeah. No, I, no, don't really. Not yet. Just, but I'm just saying. But you're right. There, there are social implications to population control policies. Look at what's happened in China. There's a disproportionate amount of males. 
and the rich people get around it in China too. Uh, uh, and, and you probably find other countries that it's even more. We are six percent of the population and use twenty five percent of the world's resources. There's this. What, what we consume, just like base level consumption. And the only section of it that I found really fascinating was that of infants in the carbon, in, carbon impact, or carbon footprint of infants in the United States. You use, in the child, the average infant wears diapers between the ages of their, like from when they're born to when they're like three years old. You go on a half, you use, I think it's uh, two and a half five gallon drums, or five, yeah, of petroleum. Redwoods of tree pulp, the equivalent of three redwoods of tree pulp, to diaper a baby for the first three years of their lives. But is taking it to the laundry and using fresh water and chemicals no, not much more? No, not at all. Right? Yeah, <laughs> babies suck. Babies do <laughs> suck. Maybe he's a toilet. Some people do that. Toilets are also kind of useful. Well, uh, you know, uh, I've seen in magazines these reusable wool menstrual pads. Outweigh the fiber in a pad. Well, yeah, and like, I mean, how many tampons and pads can be used in just like one cycle? Um, but over a lifetime, I hope you all have, well, I guess till menopause, I guess. So, so, so would we mandate then depots yeah. with always having periods? Yeah, I know. But it just goes to show we are going to have to use resources. We're going to have to eat. Humans need to eat. But that's that issue of what is sustainability, and don't be trapped by sustainable growth. You have to look at true sustainability because sustainable growth says, well, how can we keep growing? But the, if you're trying to figure out how we're going to keep growing, you're not going to solve the environmental problem. You have, you have entropy. You can't continue to grow if, if you're not right. investing anything. Or you have to figure out things that we grow that don't eat the environment. Like don't buy your friend a, a, a CD or something. Hire musicians. Right? Uh, you know, don't get your friend a... Uh, uh, electronic back massager, buy them a massage. I think there's a lot of human services that we can start to substitute, but people just have to sort of recognize that lots of things in the service industry should be considered classy and cool rather than demeaning. That service should be considered a high-end job in our culture rather than a low-end job. Because if you want to pay for human services, that doesn't take any resources on the planet. And we can have a whole growth economy in growing human service rather than human consumption of products. So the person shouldn't just sell you something, that person should do something for you. And so I think that you know there's potential, but also we probably have to change our economy. We can't have an economy that's based on growth. What about the wrapping paper industry? You just can't wrap in the suits. The amount of trash that's thrown away on the day I think if I was verbally told that I had a free massage, I wouldn't really care about the wrapping paper. They could maybe wear a little bow on their head as they gave us on. I mean, right, there's lots of things we could do that create consumption and, and employment and economic exchange, but without necessarily using resources. So. All right, well, cool. Uh, I'm quite a bit over, sorry, but...